it's now the fifth episode in our exploration of the mechanical quantities, which are combinations of space, time, and matter. More specifically, we've been concentrating on mechanical quantities where the exponent x and y are small integers, such that the quantities can be represented in a table, the table of standard mechanical quantities. In the past episodes, we've been learning how to use this tool to better understand space, time, and motion. By considering quantities on the same line, like this one, we saw that space can be understood as emerging from the ratio of two opposing mechanical factors. Here, the simple length, or size L, is understood as a compromise between two mechanisms. One symbolized by the quantity Q1 in the numerator tends to increase L, whereas the quantity Q2 in the denominator tends to shrink it. Space is understood mechanically. By considering pairs of quantities on the same column, like this one, we then showed that time can be understood in a similar way, from mechanics. A duration tau can be the result of two opposing mechanical factors. In the last episode, we considered quantities on the same diagonal of slope minus 1, like these ones. We saw that ratios of such quantities produce speeds. And because of the particular relationship between the space and time exponents for the opposing quantity q1 and q2, we saw that this formula could be written by using the space exponent x1 and x2, or the time exponents y1 and y2. After space and time, it is motion itself that is seen as the product of opposing mechanical factors. It is now time to study the general case, what emerges from considering the interplay of two arbitrary mechanical quantities. It is time to discuss the struggle in motion how kinematics can be understood as the result of a balancing act between conflicting mechanical factors. Just as in the previous episodes, we start with an arbitrary quantity, q1, in the table, with space exponent x1 and time exponent y1. We then pick a second arbitrary quantity, q2, with exponent x2 and y2. Now that we have the dimensions of these two mechanical quantities, we can wonder about the dimensions of their ratio. Of course, the mass dimension cancels out. The ratio is purely kinematic. This general formula includes the simple length when q1 and q2 are on the same line, that is when y1 is equal to y2, so the dimension of time disappears. Simple times are produced when x1 is equal to x2, so the quantities are on the same column, and the space dimension disappears. The general formula also includes simple speeds in the case where x1 minus x2 is equal to y2 minus y1. So the space exponent or the time exponents can be factored out. To better understand this general formula, we are going to assume, for now, that the space dimension refers to unique distance or size d, varying with time t, where the time dimension comes from. Since d and t are a length and a time, this equation on dimensions can very well be written like that. For didactic purpose, we can rearrange the equation so as to obtain a length on both sides. On the left, the length is the variable d, and on the right, it emerges from the dimensions of the mechanical ratio and the variable t. One way to interpret the general formula for the relationship between two arbitrary mechanical quantities is as expressing how a size or a distance d evolves with time due to the opposing effects of the mechanical factors q1 and q2. In fact, when the mechanical factors indeed reflect the struggle behind the evolution of the length d, the brackets can be dropped and the equation may be used to describe the kinematics of d versus t. Note that this is of course assuming that the exponent x1 and x2 are different. Otherwise, we get the simple times discussed in episode 3. Let's investigate further this perspective on the relationship between mechanical quantities by discussing a particular example when q1 and q2 are an energy and density. This duo is particularly useful to understand detonations, which are supersonic explosions. In this context, the energy is released by the explosion, and the density is that of the surrounding medium most commonly air. 
although the struggle between energy and density underlines many kinds of detonation, it was most famously illustrated in the case of the first nuclear test, codenamed Trinity. It's 5.30 in the morning on July 16, 1945, in the desert of New Mexico. A lot is going on in these films, some going beyond the interplay between energy and density. But if we restrict our attention to the dynamics of the blast, from 0.1 milliseconds to around 100 milliseconds, the radius of the explosion is rather well defined, and it can be tracked over time to produce a plot like this. The radius obviously does not extend linearly with time, which is to say that the speed of the explosion front is not uniform, it gradually decreases over time. If the data are represented in logarithmic scale, we recover a straight line, what can be called a power law, while the size d of the explosion is proportional to time to a power alpha. The power alpha is the slope of the line in log scale. In this particular case, the size increases by two decades when the time increases by five decades. So the exponent alpha is two over five. Where does this strange exponent come from? The answer to this question was given by the British physicist G.I. Taylor, and we've given it away already. Consider the relative place of density and energy in the table. They are separated by two lines in the time direction and by five columns in the space direction. So if we go back to our general formula for the kinematics produced by the interplay of two mechanical quantities, we can consider the special case where the impaling factor is an energy E and the impeding factor is a density rho. x1 minus x2 is 5 and y2 minus y1 is 2. So if a size grows over time under the sole influence of a struggle between energy and density, it must do so in this way. The fact that size d is proportional to time to the power 2 over 5 is a direct consequence of the dimensions of the energy and density underlying this motion. Once the opposing factors are known, the kinematics are known. The mechanics imply the kinematics. Note that this implication is no equivalence. Knowing that the size is proportional to time to the power 2 over 5 does not imply that these kinematics are due to the interplay of energy and density. The exponent of the kinematics is due to the relative dimensions of the pair of mechanical quantities. Different pairs with the same relative placement would generate the same kinematics. We will return to this asymmetry between mechanics and kinematics in future videos. Our goal today is to focus on predicting the kinematics from a knowledge of the underlying mechanical factors. Going back to our example, if the dynamics are indeed due to the interplay of energy and density, we expect the radius to follow a power law of time with an exponent 2 over 5, and a prefactor given by the ratio of energy and density. If the values of the energy and density are known, we can predict how the size of the explosion evolves over time. If we assume the equality to be exact, and that we know the density of the air to be around 1.2 kg per cubic meter, then the best 2 over 5 fit to the data would predict that the energy of this first nuclear explosion was around 8 10 to the 13 joules, which is equivalent to around 20,000 tons of TNT. Although this estimate is quite accurate, the energy found in this way may slightly differ from measurements using other methods. These finer corrections can be encompassed into a dimensionless prefactor, delta, a number close to 1. We'll come back to these dimensionless prefactors in another video, and for now we'll keep in mind that these corrections are hiding behind approximate equalities. For our purpose today, we can say that the agreement between the data and the mechanical model is such that we can safely say that the dynamics of this explosion are due to the struggle between the energy output of the bomb, E, and the density of the surrounding air, rho. Let's recap. Because the energy is in the numerator, it is driving motion. In contrast, since density is in the denominator, it is slowing down motion. 
the energy is what we've been calling the impelling factor, and the density is what we can call the impeding factor. This little duel of mechanical factors does not exactly look like the mechanics we were taught in school, but it actually shares the same philosophy. What we will see now is that the impelling factor is a generalization of the concept of a force, and the impeding factor is a generalization of the concept of inertial mass. This exotic equation is actually not that far from F equals ma, Newton's second law, the bedrock of classical mechanics. Now let's consider that the impelling factor is a force, and the impeding factor is a mass. The two quantities are separated by one column and two lines. So according to the general formula, plugging in the force as impelling factor and the mass as impeding factor, we get a size varying with the square of the time. What does this mean? We know we can think of d as the size of an object or as a distance traveled by an object. We can then consider the mean speed as the length d over the duration t to get there. The speed is now proportional to the time variable t, so the speed increases uniformly. Now we can ask how does the speed varies over the duration t, which gives an acceleration a. This acceleration is now independent of the time variable. As long as we understand how the length d, the speed v, and the acceleration a are defined with respect to one another, then these two equations are really equivalent. They both describe the same motion, governed by the interplay of force and mass, but from slightly different perspectives. And of course, we are free to rearrange the last equation and pay tribute to Newton, the person most frequently associated with this formula. Well, it's almost the formula we know from textbooks. Here we've dragged our cautious approximate equality symbol, but the equation we find in textbook is F equals ma. That looks more serious. So which is it? A strict equality? Or an approximate equality? Could it even be that this equation is actually a definition? We will come back to this conundrum in other videos. For now, we'll be prudent and keep the approximate equality. Let's consider an example to illustrate this duo between a force and a mass. The free fall of an object in near vacuum, without any significant friction. A feather and a bowling ball follow the same trajectory, accelerating as they fall. The dynamics are similar for an object falling in the air, as long as we restrict our attention to the beginning of the trajectory, before friction becomes more important. In this time range, the travel distance grows more and more rapidly, proportionally to the square of the duration since the object started falling. In log scale, the slope of the line is 2, which is seen a bit more clearly if we draw the plot as a square, with an aspect ratio of 1. For a free fall, the exponent is 2, where it was 2 over 5 for explosions. Just as in the case of explosions, the goal is now to understand the kinematic prefactor k from a ratio of opposing mechanical factors. The short answer is that the acceleration manifested in this freefall can be expressed from the ratio of the weight of the object, that is the force F, and the mass of the object, m. The formula you'll find in textbooks includes a factor one half. We will bicker over these subtleties another time, but this factor close to one has to do with the way in which the force and the mass are defined with respect to one another, and the way acceleration is defined from the instantaneous second derivative of the distance d, not as an average. For now, the approximate equality will suffice. We could call this regime Newton's regime, or Galileo's regime, since he also contributed a lot to its understanding. But we are going to see so many of these regimes that naming them after their discoverers will be impractical. So we'll just call this regime the force-mass regime, or the mass-force regime after the two mechanical quantities behind it. The order of the terms, mass-force or force-mass, does not matter. That is why we use curly brackets or braces, which are often used for sets which do not care about the orders of their elements. 
for a particular pair of mechanical quantities, the impelling and impeding factors are set by the dimensions of the quantities. This is quite clear on the general formula. The quantity Q1 is in the numerator if x1 minus x2 is positive. So the motor of motion, the impelling factor, is always the quantity on the rightmost side of the table. So we've seen mass and force, and we've seen density and energy, two out of many possible pairs. Both of these scalings express how space varies with time as the result of a competition or a struggle between the impelling and impeding factors. In the second scaling, the energy takes the place of the force, and the density takes the place of the mass. The kinematics are different because the dimensions of the mechanical factors are different. Although the first regime was revealed earlier in the history of science, it is not more fundamental than the second. For the longest time, motion was practically synonymous with motion at constant speed. The concept of acceleration was not really developed until the Islamic Golden Age and until the Renaissance in Europe. We've just talked about a famous example, Galileo and Newton's studies of the free fall. And it took a few more centuries to accept the possibility for motion that was neither at constant speed nor uniformly accelerated. After t to the power 1 and t to the power 2, it was t to the power 1 half that earned its place with the study of diffusion by figures such as Graham, Fick, Einstein, Perrin. The closer we get to the present day, the longer the list of contributors to pay tribute to. One, two, one half. The realization that these three historically significant exponents are not fundamentally spatial is still very much in progress. The two over five exponent of the detonation regime is not fundamentally weirder than the two of the free fall. We just had less time to get used to it. To illustrate how different values of exponents emerge when pairing different mechanical quantities, we'll now discuss a series of examples where we will keep the same impeding factor, density, but where we will successively consider five different motors, an energy E, a force F, a stiffness gamma, a stress sigma, or a force density psi. These five different motors, energy, force, stiffness, stress, and force density, are on the same line, with time exponent minus two. We can then invoke the general formula. The examples we are talking about now all have the same impeding factor, density, and the motors Q1 all have Y1 equals minus 2. We can simplify a bit this expression to get this formula, which gives the scaling between space and time in the case where the impeding factor is density and where the impelling factor is on the line with the time exponent equals to minus 2. Evidently, the exponent of the time variable depends on the space exponent x1 of the chosen quantity q1. We can then use this formula to obtain the scaling for each choice of motor q1, that is for each value of x1. If x1 equals 2, we get 2 over 5. We've already discussed this in the context of explosions. Considering x1 is equal to 1, we get force and density with the time exponent 2 over 4, that is 1 half. We'll give an example of this scaling in a minute. If we keep going with our list, we have x1 is equal to 0, combining stiffness and density, which leads to t to the power 2 over 3, a scaling that is indeed observed, as we will see shortly. Moving on to x1 is equal to minus 1, well, we know this one already. The time exponent is 2 over 2, so d is simply proportional to time. And this stress density regime corresponds to the propagation of sound, which we discussed in the last episode on simple speeds. Our last example is x1 is equal to minus 2, force density psi, and mass density rho. The exponents simplify and we get a size d proportional to the square of time, just as in the free fall. Let's try to understand this last regime first. We have rho and psi and they have the same relative positions than m and f, which we know from the free-fall example. Indeed, 
a force density can be understood well as a force per unit volume, and a density or mass density is a mass per unit volume. Both of these regimes describe a freefall, but whereas the force mass regime requires to know the total force F on the total mass M of the falling object, the force density and mass density formulation may be used in cases where we are dealing with a continuous material of unspecified volume. Whereas the force mass regime may be used to understand a falling apple, the force density and density regime can be used to understand the initial dynamics during the failure of a dam, or an avalanche, or a landslide, to cite just a few examples. There are plenty of examples out there of this scaling. Okay then, we have two more examples we need to talk about, force versus density and stiffness versus density. Let's discuss this one first. We've seen the pinching of liquids in previous episodes. When the fluid is very viscous, we talked about the fact that the neck decreases with a constant speed, the viscocapillary speed, the ratio between surface tension and viscosity. We can also write this result as a regime where the size of the neck D is proportional to the duration T remaining before pinch off. Let's make this a little bit clearer by looking at some data. In this experiment by McKinley and Tripathi, a bridge of viscous fluid is formed between two concentric plates, and the dynamics of the neck is followed over time. The fluid is glycerol, with a viscosity a thousand times that of water. On this plot, the time on the x-axis is a bit arbitrary, the clock having been set to zero around half a second before the instant of pinch-off. We could set the clock to zero at the instant of pinch-off. For instance, with negative time before pinch-off and positive time after it, or the other way around. This time is what we call t, the duration remaining before the instant of pinch-off. We can replot in log scale and check that indeed the slope of the line is 1. Not only the neck radius is proportional to time, but experiments on fluids with different values of viscosity and surface tension would reveal that we are indeed faced with the viscocapillary regime. All of this is very nice, but that's not the scaling we set out to discuss. We don't want surface tension and viscosity, but surface tension and density. Same impaling factor but different impeding factor. We've set the stage with the viscous case. Now, what if the fluid is less viscous, like water? In the episode on simple time, we encountered this situation already. Then we only wondered about the total time for the pinching to occur, but we can now ask about the more precise dynamics of the neck during pinching. If we plot the radius of the neck, it is quite clear that it is not linear. We can then follow the same procedure as in the viscous case, use the duration of pinch off as time, and plot the dynamics in log scale. We get a straight line that is a parallel. And lo and behold, we get a slope of two thirds. We'll discuss this in a lot more details in the upcoming series on droplets, but repeating these experiments on fluids with different values of density and surface tension would reveal that what we are seeing unfold is indeed the interplay of these two mechanical quantities surface tension, and density. We've got one last example to go. Force versus density. Here, the exponent is one half. This one shows up in a lot of places, and in particular in this ever-fascinating realm of droplets and bubbles. In this context, the force is usually written as the product of a surface tension, gamma, and a size, d. Typically that of the drop, or the nozzle used for pinching. This formulation has generated a tremendous amount of confusion. Telling this story is beyond our point today, but we will return to this in a future video. So we won't put a check mark on this one just yet, but we will eventually do. Since we're getting close to the end of this episode, let's go back to our table of standard mechanical quantities. To the simple length and to the simple times and simple speeds, of the previous episodes, we've now added a few examples of pairs of mechanical quantities generating more subtle spatiotemporal relationships, which we expressed as sizes growing with different powers of the time t. 
We saw force and mass, the template set for us by Galileo and Newton. We've seen energy and density with explosions, force and density, and stiffness or surface tension and density with droplets and bubbles, stress and density with the speed of sound, force density and density with dam failure, landslides or avalanches. We've only surveyed a tiny fraction of the literature, but we've also found examples for a dozen more pairs. We will introduce these additional regimes progressively in future videos. We can just mention a few pairs as a teaser. Action and mass, for instance. Maybe you can guess this example belongs to quantum mechanics. Power density and mass density, useful in the context of turbulence. Viscosity and density for boundary layers in hydrodynamics. Power and density for steerers. Power and stress in the context of sintering. Can you think of situations where the dynamics would be governed by the pair of force and viscosity, or surface tension and mass flux? All right, we get the idea. There are a lot of possible pairs, and a lot of these have already been observed in various contexts. In all these examples, a size grows over time, as a power law, because in all these cases, the diagonal between the two mechanical quantities is descending. What if it is the other way around? In that case, the size will be shrinking rather than growing. The exponent of time alpha is negative rather than positive. The criterion is quite obvious if we look back at the general formula. The exponent of time is what we've been calling alpha. To keep with the conventions we already established, we label the mechanical quantities such that q1 is really in the numerator, so 1 over x1 minus x2, is positive, not negative, which would switch the roles between q1 and q2. So x1 is greater than x2. Then the condition for shrinking, that is alpha negative, is equivalent to y2 being smaller than y1. So the impeding factor must be below the impelling factor in the table. In other words, the diagonal between these two mechanical quantities must be ascending. In log scale with arbitrary units of time and space, the scaling resulting from such a pair would be a descending straight line. Note that this behavior is very different from cases where a size d decreases to zero after a finite time, as in the case of pinching. In this situation, we saw that we could recover the case where d grows over time by defining the time as the duration left before d equals zero. With what we're now calling shrinking, this redefinition of time cannot take place, because the size never reaches zero. This is quite evident in linear scale, where it is apparent that not only the size d only asymptotically goes to zero, but the size diverges for t equals zero. Can such behavior be observed? Probably not the diverging part, but we can certainly imagine a size decreasing with time according to such a curve but only for a certain amount of time. Do we have examples? Can you think of any example? If you do, please share your thoughts with the hashtag shrinking. We will return to such shrinking dynamics in a future video. We are not yet ready to tackle them. We will first need to know how dynamics can transition from one regime to another. For instance here, how before the shrinking part, there might be a regime growing linearly, why not? and how the shrinking part could stop at some simple length. We'll get to such kinds of intersections of regimes soon enough. Something else we'll need to better understand shrinking is how to express the scaling between two mechanical quantities, not just from a size evolving over time, but from any pair of different kinematic variables, like a speed versus a time, or a speed versus a distance, or a frequency versus a wave number which is called a dispersion relation. There are many different kinematic perspectives on the spatiotemporal relationship between a pair of mechanical factors. Expressing this relationship as a psi growing or shrinking over time is a convenient viewpoint, which we will adopt for most of this series, but keep in mind that it is but one choice of perspective, which we will eventually challenge. If you're impatient, just check the explosion series, 
where we were doing this in the first part of the last episode. We are starting to understand this mysterious table more intimately. In this episode, we've seen that we don't have to restrict ourselves to lines, columns, or diagonals of slope minus 1, which provide simple length, times, and speeds. These were just instructive special cases. We can pick any pair of mechanical quantities, like energy and density. What we saw today is what happens if we forget about all the other quantities and focus on the pair we've chosen. This mechanical table or mechanical plane has just two points for now. Here, one is called rho and the other e. These two characters interact with one another with definite roles. The quantity on the rightmost side is always the impaling factor, and the other is the impeding factor. So here, energy drives and density slows things down. The interplay of any pair of distinct mechanical quantities produces a parallel in what we call the kinematic plane. No particular points stand out on this line. Here we've used the point at the bottom left corner to set the units of time and space, but any other point would have been as equally valid. That is why parallels are sometimes said to be self-similar, and we'll see this in a lot more details in a future video. The slope of this line is the exponent alpha. In this example, the line climbs by two decades in space when it increased by five decades in time. This is seen more clearly if we use the same distance for decades in time and space. Alpha is equal to 2 over 5. The slope or exponent alpha is quite simply given by the relative dimensions of the two mechanical quantities. The difference of 5 in the space exponents in the mechanical plane becomes the 5 decades in time in the kinematic plane, and the difference of 2 time exponents between the two decades in space for the kinematics. And that's it. Motion emerges out of the interplay, or struggle, between two mechanical quantities. What's going on when we consider three, four, or even more quantities will be discussed in the rest of this series. But first, we gotta talk about something that can cause a lot of confusion if not properly addressed. Whereas for each pair of mechanical quantities, one is always necessarily the motor, there is no absolute impelling nor impeding quantity. Viscosity, for instance, can sometimes be in the driver's seat, and even mass can drive motion, in which case it is not called inertial, but gravitational. And this will be the subject of the next episode.